my name's Taurus Baylog, and um, I work at Amazon uh, Web Services along with Rich Bowen and Spot Calloway, who spoke yesterday. Uh, prior to that, however, for 20 years, I ran an open source business based upon a project called OpenNMS. And I assume no one here has ever heard of OpenNMS. Oh, we've got, <laughs> we've got a few people. <laughs> so it was a, a enterprise grade network monitoring uh, platform. And in that 20 years, we tried every possible method to make money. And so I tried to distill what I've learned in 20 years into this presentation. Um, now, I have a blog called adventuresinoss.com. It just turned 21 years old. So you can go and look, and I have detailed a lot of that, that journey. Some of it hasn't aged well. Uh, feel free to call out on me if that is, if that is the case. Um, so how many of you are old enough to remember text adventures? Like, great, then you'll enjoy this. So I made this like a test, text adventure. <laughs> so um, the first thing when I'm talking about open source business models is I'm talking about true open source companies, which means if your software is open source, you do not sell software. Um, and when we talk about open source, we go back to the cathedral and the bazaar. And so I wanted to start off talking about, you know, Cathedral was the proprietary software stack where everything was very regimented. And we talked about open source being more like a bazaar, more like an open air market. And so as our adventure starts, we have the choice to choose between proprietary regimented software or the bazaar. So of course, we're going to go south and go visit the bazaar. Now, as you know, when you, when you start dealing with open source, come on in, please. Um, you missed the team picture. Um, so there's a lot of open source companies. I'm a big fan of Red Hat. I live in the United States in a state called North Carolina, which is where Red Hat was founded. Um, but uh, we work closely with things like the Ap Apache Software Foundation. Um, so the reason I bring these two up is when you're starting to think about your open source business, you have the choice of going corporate, like a Red Hat where you're going to be a for-profit company, or you can start a foundation. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it, I'm one of those weird people who looks up tax records of foundations, and directors of some of these foundations make a really good salary. So you can make a good living running a foundation and not having to run a, 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 a corporation. Um, this is a choice that's up to you. But it's a choice you have to make. So let's decide, OK, we've decided we're going to make an open source uh, company. So your quest is to create a viable business model. And the key word there is viable. We want something that's actually a business um, in using open source software. And as I mentioned, we're not going to be selling software. But as someone who did this for 20 years, the, the 20 years I spent doing open source software were the most rewarding years of my life. And so I strongly recommend, if you love open source and you really, really want to make a business out of it, this is something you should pursue. So my story was, was kind of interesting. OpenNMS, the, the product, project I was involved with, I didn't start it. Some friends of mine started it, and they had a company called Oculan, your eye on the network. And uh, they paid a lot of money for that. Um, anyway. Uh, so I, 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 I joined them to build a service and support business around OpenNMS because back in 2001, this is kind of what we started off with. Let's build a services and support business. And so, again, we're not selling software. The way I used to describe my job was I'm a plumber. So I live on a farm out in the middle of nowhere, and I do a lot of work with wood. I do a lot of work with electricity. When it comes to plumbing, I am horrible. I end up wet, I end up frustrated, and I end up having to call someone anyway to fix all the mistakes I made. <laughs> and so the idea when we were selling our services was, you're smart, you have smart people working for you, but we focus on our product. So just like you would pay for a plumber for their expertise, you can pay us for our expertise and we will save you time and save you money, and you can get the most value out of this open source product. And it worked really, really well. We ended up having a lot of people uh, uh, paying us. 
Um, one of the things that I recommend, you hear the term, you know, make things easier to sell. I'm a firm believer in make things easier to buy. <laughs> and traditionally, when you talk about consulting, there's usually this very long process. You, you do a statement of work, you go back and forth, and you create these documents. And I, I, I worked as a consultant for many years, and I can honestly tell you that 90% of that fancy document is boilerplate. And you just go in and fill in the 10%. So we decided to productize our services. So a lot of people were like, I need to get started with OpenNMS. And we'd say, okay, fine, we have a green light project. And that was a week of services and a year of support, and you just paid a flat fee, plus travel and expenses. Nowadays, with everyone being remote, there's probably not travel and expenses anymore. But what ended up happening was we started to plateau. Like our growth was very, very strong in the beginning, and then it just started to level off. And so we tried to expand. And one of the other things we came up with was um, custom development. We had a number of customers who would come to us and say, OpenNMS does 95% of what I need it to do, and I will pay you to do the other 5%. And that turned out to be a very good business. Now, it presented its own challenges because they'll say, well, I will pay you to do this, but I don't want to share. <laughs> I want you to make it just for me. And I'd say, okay, I'm going to charge you five times more money. <laughs> and they would go, well, why? And I'm like, well, you know, now I have to keep two branches. I have to keep your stuff separate. I have to make sure that it's always, uh, when we make changes to the mainline code base, that your changes, changes work. And I was able to convince the first few custom development customers to let us open source and include in the general product their features. And what that allowed me to do is in the future, anytime asked me, anyone said, hey, I don't want to open source this feature, I would pull out my Excel spreadsheet and say, well, here are all the features someone else paid for that you're getting for free. And it's like, so if, if, if they came to me and said, okay, I need this feature, and I'd say, that's going to cost $100,000. And if they said, well, it's not, it's, it's not worth it to me. And I've said, well, that's a business decision. It's not an open source decision. If, if this feature is not going to save you $100,000, don't do it. But in most cases, we could make the argument that it would save you $100,000. So you might as well do it anyway, because it makes business sense. It's going to save you money. And you can join this kind of corpus of special features that people paid for. And so a lot of our research and development was paid for by our customers, which was a really cool place to be. Now, the problem with that is eventually that starts to plateau and you start running into this kind of scalability issues. And so I decided, okay, I'm gonna seek inspiration. So I started looking all around at possible ways to generate more revenue. And it was a bit of an adventure. So I looked at all these different business models. And in my adventure, I basically went down this dark alley. So I went down into this dark alley, and I was introduced to something I'm going to call you're in a maze of twisty passages all alike. <laughs> and so it was kind of confusing. Everyone was coming at me with different ways of trying to make money. And it, it, they almost always came down to what we used to call open core. Uh, the woman who gave the keynote yesterday had, had called it freemium, which is apparently the, uh, the new one. And I know a number of businesses that do what I would call the open core model, where some the core of the product is open source, but the, there are certain features that they hide and they're, they're kind of proprietary. Ultimately, I'm for any business model that produces more open source software. So I'm not here to criticize open core. If it is super useful, the community has the option to fork it and make it their own. Uh, we've seen recently a lot of companies are changing their licenses and the community can respond by saying, okay, well, we're gonna fork this and we're gonna go our own way. Um, but it's something I did explore. Now, in here, um, I basically said, okay, let's look at open core. And we, we agonized over whether or not we should do that. And I'm, I'm a, a bit of a free software enthusiast, so I was like very reluctant. And 
I came across an article, now this is somewhat dated. It was an article by a guy named Brian Prentice for Gartner. And he basically said, open core is the emperor's new clothes. And this is Gartner. This is a very well-respected organization. And he basically said, if you're dealing with open core, you have to treat it as if it was a proprietary software purchase. I mean, I worked, with, with, I, I worked for very large companies before I, I started on my open source journey. And if they bought uh, a product from even Microsoft or Oracle, they, if they spent enough money, they could see the code, what we're calling source available. It's like, hey, we need to do our own audit, and we're going to spend $10 million on this product. We want to see the code. And they would, under NDA and everything, they'd let you do it. So this idea of, oh, I'm going to be magnanimous and show you the code, that existed long before we had source available kind of licenses. But anyway, what was interesting about Brian Prentice article is it kind of put the end to open core which I was very, very grateful for. Now, what happened was companies would come out and they would have an open source component, but they weren't exactly advertising themselves as an open source company like we were. Because it used to be frustrating. I'd be at a conference and someone would come up to me and go, yes, but what about your enterprise version? And we were like, well, we only have one version and it's the enterprise version and it's open, it's free. <laughs> Um, so we definitely don't want to, we're just going to drop the whole idea of being open core. Um, and anyway, I had to throw this in here because if you go down the open, open core path, you're likely to be eaten by group. Anyway, there are other options. So I'm trying to, to find inspiration and um, part of it was this company called Red Hat. You know, Red Hat was probably the first and most successful open source company in existence. So my friend Spot, who's the guy in the back, um, I said, I want to meet Jim Whitehurst, who's the CEO of, of Red Hat. And he's like, fine. He says, write Jim at redhat.com and tell him I sent you. So I wrote a letter. And um, probably within two hours, he wrote me back. And it was obvious he wrote me back, not Andrea, his assistant. And he's like, sure. He says, talk to Andrea, my assistant, and get on my calendar. And for about three years, I got an hour of his time to talk about um, you know, what does it mean to be an open source company? And we would come out with these different ideas about how we could change our product. And I think if you ever look up, in the US we have this legend of a man named D.B. Cooper who hijacked an airplane and jumped out of the airplane with uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and he disappeared forever. And that also happened in North Carolina where I live. If you ever look at the drawings of D.B. Cooper and a picture of Jim Whitehurst, they are very similar. <laughs> um, but anyway, nicest guy in, in the business that I'd, I'd, I'd ever met. And so we started adopting a Red Hat model. What I found was customers were more willing to pay for stability than they were new features. So at OpenNMS, we created two versions. We had Horizon, because the Horizon's always moving, and that was our public development version. And then we had Meridian, because Meridians stay in place. Meridian was our, it's a version that lagged, and you had to have a, a, a subscription to get access to our repos. They were password protected repos. Both products were published under the Afero GPL version three. So they were both open source. And if you, if you read, there's nothing wrong with, with charging for open source. Now, people who got our Meridian product, there was nothing preventing them from sharing it. But I found that most people, if they pay for something, they're not likely to share it. And if it had happened, I would have considered it a win. To me, if like someone thought long and hard enough that they wanted to come and create like a CentOS out of our product, I would have been perfectly happy with that. Um, but anyway, so, so dealing with Jim, um, it is... So we came up with this idea that companies, when it comes to open source, companies are willing to pay for three things. They're willing to pay for simplicity, they're willing to pay for security, and they're willing to pay for stability. Otherwise, they'll just do it on their own. Um, and so anyway, um, we took that to heart. Uh, and I really want you, if, if you take anything away from this, this conversation, remember those three S's. Simplicity, security, and stability. Now, in, in, prepar in, in preparation for this, I went to ChatGPT and said, what's the best open source model? 
And ChatGPT wimped out and said, well, there are about six different models. So I wanted to cover some of them. And so I have these little three stalls here. And one of them that it suggested is advertising. And I don't know a single product or project that makes a living like this. I can imagine perhaps you could come up with an open source project that people would want to come to your website or what's, you know, frequently enough or your forums frequently enough that you could serve ads. Maybe you could do training videos that served ads and you could generate revenue that way. So I'm throwing it out here in completeness, but it is not necessarily something I would pursue. I don't, I can't imagine a situation where that would be a viable business model. SourceForge. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's someone, does anyone here remember SourceForge? That was the question from yesterday. Um, now, there is another option which everyone says is, well, you could do basically tips. Uh, this would be, uh, you know, GitHub has GitHub sponsors. And you could basically put out your tip jar and say, here, this is free, you know, give us, give us money. I, in, in the early days of OpenMS, I published my Amazon wish list. And every so often, someone would spend $20 or something and buy me something. Like in the movie Office Space, I really wanted one of those red swing line staplers. And someone bought me a red swing line staplers. But you can't eat <laughs> a, a red swing line uh, stapler. So again, I don't think this is a viable business model. One that I wish I was talented enough to think about, um, this quote here uh, is, comes from a post by this guy named uh, Felipe, Felipe Valsorda. And if, uh, back in 2023, he published on his blog, I'm now a full-time professional open source maintainer. Holy shit, it works. And what he did is he was, he's a programmer. Um, there's a, a good example of someone like this is Yarek actually right here. If you build enough of a reputation in a particular open source um, project, you can go independent and find people who use this project to sponsor you. Now you have to learn how to manage these invoices and price things and do billing and things like this, but you can be an independent contributor and get paid for doing open source. Like I said, I am not a programmer. I have programmed um, the very few pull requests I submitted, you could see the CTO roll his eyes. It's like, dear God, not another one from Taurus. It's just, you know, I'm not talented enough to do that. But I honestly think that is a valid business model. If you can build a reputation in a community where other companies find your project valuable, you can go and do that custom development thing. I will make these new features, I will fix these bugs, and you pay me for it. But Ultimately, I came to the decision that the best model you can come up with is what I call managed open source. And the example company I use is WordPress. I'm old, and I have this thing called a blog. There was this thing called Google Reader back in the day, and people had these things called blogs. And instead of having Facebook or Instagram or the Snapchat, we had um, uh, Google Reader, and it would go out and using a technology called really simple syndication, would put everyone's blog in a way you could consume it very, very easily. And one of the companies that did, that made this blogging software is called WordPress. And I use WordPress, I mean, it's great. It, they have this thing called a five minute install. And for me, it takes maybe three and a half minutes. Basically, you, uh, you pull up your server, you set up a, a database user, you download a tarball, you drop it in your web root, you go to a web page, fill out some form, fill out some information, hit go, you have a web page. But that assumes you have a server. That assumes you understand how to do a database user. And to me, I have to go always look it up. But that's pretty much two of minutes of the three and a half minutes for me to install it. Um, but if you don't want to do that, you can go to WordPress.com. And you can get a free website as long as uh, WordPress gets to serve ads. Or for like 10 bucks a month, they will do it for you. That is that whole simplicity thing. And while you know, WordPress may not be the, the ultimate example for, for business models, I honestly think that being true to open source, yet creating a business that can scale. Like I used to get, when we had a services business, I used to get emails that said, I can double your sales. And I'm like, dear God, no. <laughs> I don't have enough people. And that's not a problem you want. You want that problem. When Zoom came out, I, I got a Zoom account. I went and signed up for Zoom. No one at Zoom knew I existed. Right? I was a number on a spreadsheet somewhere. 
Um, and for, as a business person, you, I, I love knowing my customers and I love working directly with my customers, but the idea to generate revenue without having to bring on headcount is kind of the holy grail. And one way to do that is managed open source. Anyway, so I'm gonna host my application. I'm gonna host it in the cloud or I'm gonna host it on-prem and I'm gonna make it, and so congratulations, you have won the open source business model. Um, and anyway, as a reward, there's a crystal flask on the marble, and so let's get ye flask. This is a very obscure um, internet reference to Strong Bad, but um, in case you haven't seen it. Anyway, that is my presentation. Uh, I hope it was useful. I assume we have some time for some questions, and uh, be happy to answer any questions I can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? For the great talk. My question is about the custom development. You said that you convinced the customers then to open source it. Had you have situations where the custom development wasn't really interesting for you to integrate into the open source mainline? That is a beautiful question. One of the so my biggest regret in OpenNMS is we could have been Datadoc. I don't know if you know Datadog, but they're a, they're a monitoring, they're a cloud-based monitoring company worth billions and billions of dollars. A friend of mine was like employee number 10. He's 10 years younger than me and he's retired now because <laughs> uh, they had a huge IPO. Um, we had ideas, but because we were bootstrapped, we had no VC money. Um, our business model was called spend less money than you earn. It's crazy. I know the whole idea, but what we ended up doing was sometimes a customer would come to us with a feature that was only good for that customer, and it didn't. Now, luckily, the majority of the time, like SNMP version three support, a bank paid for that, and that everybody loved it because you know that when when SNMP security became an issue, but that's a decision you have to make, and our, we decided that we were going to do this work. And of course, it was open source. We were test-driven development, so we could keep, you know, every time we made a change to the main code, we made sure that this feature, this obscure little feature worked. Um, but it does take away from something that may make you a lot more money down the road. So it is something that you have to balance. And I think we did it wrong. You know, if I had to change it, I would have probably turned down, said, sorry, that's really obscure. It's going to take a lot of time and our resources need to be focused on our roadmap versus this little side road. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I don't know the answer. I know that we answered it wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a oh, we one did? question before that. Oh. We, uh, one question from the online audience. Would you say that passing off liability is also a reason why companies pay for open source? <sighs> yes. Um, we again looked to Red Hat, and Red Hat had a clause in there, it's called indemnification. And it's like, hey, I use your software and there's a problem, will you protect me? Um, we were a tiny, tiny company. Um, and we just copied Red Hat, which offered indemnification at 4X your price. So if you paid us for support, let's say you paid us $15,000 a year for support, we would indemnify you up to $60,000. Um, so that was kind of hidden in the contract, <laughs> you know, that there was a limit on it, but we would talk about indemnification. Uh, I know in the world of AI right now, there's a whole big talk about we, you know, if, if you get sued for copyright infringement, we will protect you. Um, and so they do look at that and that is a selling point. Um, in a lot of cases, we ended up selling support, um, just because the company, that's what they did. I can remember there was this great conversation when we very first started our company. They said, well, what distributions are you gonna support? And I'm a free software enthusiast. I'm like, Debian, that's it. We're gonna support Debian. And my business partner was like, well, what about Red Hat? I'm like, well, Red Hat's kinda, you have to pay for that. I don't, I don't wanna do that. And he was like, well, you realize people who pay for Red Hat are more likely to pay for our support I love this idea. This is a great idea. We should support Red Hat. And uh, so I, I did have my mind changed. But yes, indemnification is definitely something that, um, that customers look for. You mentioned the, the need to grow. How about staying stable at a nice level? Would that work? Yes. So, uh, 
So I was, I've been thinking a lot about the, the um, uh, what was it, really open security talk that we had yesterday. Now, if you ever deal with venture capitalists, um, they will pat you on your head and say, you have a very nice lifestyle company. Pat, 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 pat. I have a friend who is worth 10 figures, and he has a very nice lifestyle company. We didn't have a very good lifestyle. Like, uh, we worked really, really hard, and we made money, and everyone got paid, but it was, if you can work it out, there's nothing wrong with, with doing that. And, and it seemed like the, 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 the really open, or radically open security company, they had a beautiful lifestyle company. They, they got paid, they were able to, to donate a lot of money to charity, and they got a lot of value out of it. And trust me, when I was young, and old people like me would say, hey, you need to do something you enjoy. Um, uh, and I'd say, uh, you know, not just for the money. And when I was young, I was like, no, I'll make a lot of money and I can buy the things I enjoy. And um, it's not. When you're, doing, when, you're, when you're running your own business, you're probably at it 10, 12 hours a day if you're doing it right. you got to enjoy it. Um, and if, if that's it, if you can enjoy it and make enough money to, to meet your lifestyle, that's, that's amazing. With us, we always struggled with trying to, to you know, make enough to grow. And so, now, you've had your hand up since the start, so I want to make sure you get the microphone, because, yeah, right, this, this uh, person right here. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. With all the examples that you showed, um, you were exploring the business-to-business -business world, and I was wondering if you also had experience when it comes to um, selling or providing services to public administration, because in my experience, Public administration also wants stability and security and simplicity, but they're not as willing to pay for quality as other businesses, so they want all these, uh, um, these, these things, um, but they will choose, when there's a tender, they will choose the, the cheapest vendor. Yeah. Uh, then the project you know, fails and they say open source uh, sucks, we wanted it, but it didn't work out. <laughs> and I was wondering if you had any experiences or advice in that regard for open source businesses who you know, deal with public administration? Sure. Rule number one, never sell on price. I mean, it's one of the things you're trying to do when you're, when you're running a business. Oh, we're open source, it's free software. Never sell on price. Um, because you're, you're good, you have a great product, you solve things, you, you can eventually, it could be like the third or fourth thing, but never go into it selling on price because everyone just goes, oh, I want the cheapest thing. The second thing is to say no to customers. Like our starting package was about $20,000. And I would be on the phone with a potential customer and they'd be talking and they would say, you know, oh, I want this. And they had this huge laundry list. And we're, well, what's your budget? And they'd say $12,000. I'm like, get what's up goal. <laughs> I'm like, because you just can't even get started with us. And when you run an open source company, you need to be more particular about your customers because if you have a mismatch, if you sell into a company that really isn't a good match, you're going to spend way more effort supporting that customer than you would if you just said, go away. With public companies, we actually did have a number of cities, like the city of Portland was a customer of ours. Um, and it, was, it seemed to be fine. They seemed to get it. Um, in the U.S., again, Portland is kind of on the more liberal side of uh, the spectrum in America. And, well, it's probably on the liberal side of Jesus, but um, uh, the uh, uh, um, but they they had kind of this motion for open source, this this you know open first, you know if they couldn't find anything that was open source, so we had an advantage, and that's something you can play to your advantage when you're dealing with 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 companies with with uh, with public institutions, but like you said, some public institutions are, are lowest bid wins, and the thing is, do not go that way. If, if it's not a good match and if you're not getting paid for your work, you got to say no. And there are times where you just really want that income and you want to say yes, say no. You'll, 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 we'll appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cool. Well, thank you again talk. for your thank attention. You. I'll be Big around club. and be, be, uh, be happy to see you. Cheers.